Thank you everybody for coming today. I'm very delighted to introduce Palmer, uh, who is kind of a brother to me, even though we were never at the same place. At, 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 we were together, not to, we were never together, but he went to Gaston Berger and that's where I got my BA. And then he went to, to University of Missoula. I went there. And then he was at Urbana Champaign, and I went there. So when, whenever I came, they tell me about Falu. I just have longer legs, so I uh, <laughs> can <came ready. laughs> So I'm, I'm very delighted to be here today and introducing him. And also, today is a big holiday in Senegal. It's uh, Magaltuba, for those of you who have been to Senegal. And since Paolo was coming and it's muggle too, but I thought it would be fitting to have some Senegalese food. So I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> so, Professor Ngom is a professor of anthropology and director of the African Studies Center at Boston University. His research interests include the interaction between African languages and non-African languages, the adaptation of Islam in sub-Saharan Africa, and Ajami literature, records of African language, languages written in Arabic script. He seeks to understand the knowledge buried in African Ajami literatures and the historical, <coughs> social, cultural, and religious heritage that has found expression in this manner. Uh, his work has appeared in several scholarly, scholarly journals, including African Studies Review, Journal of Arabic and Islamic <coughs> Studies, Language Variation and Change, and International Journal of the Sociology of Language. His book, Muslims Beyond the Arab World, The Odyssey of Ajami and the Muridia from Oxford University Press, won the Melville G. Herskovich Her Prize for the best scholarly book in African Studies in 2017. And Professor Ngom's talk is titled, Beyond Oral Traditions, Lessons from Ajami Sources of Africa. So thank you, Pablo. All right, thank you very much. <clears throat> Uh, well, thank you very, very much. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, yeah okay, great. Uh, thank you, sister. Uh, it's been a, a pleasure to be here. And uh, it's a special day because, as she said, it's the Muggle. The Muggle is uh, my only holiday. Uh, and so I'm happy to be here on that particular holiday uh, for the Murid. It's a significant day. So this is, uh, uh, it makes this day very special for me. So thank you all for coming, and thanks to uh, Professor Jamie Monson uh, and uh, Nicole uh, for making things happen, uh, Liz Timms, and I see friends here, Catherine Foley, Peter, John, uh, uh, Gallen, and friends, and uh, the big brother. So thank you all for making it happen. Uh, uh, one person that is not here that I have that I wish to uh, recognize is Professor David Robinson, uh, who has been uh, critical in uh, supporting Ajami projects. Uh, uh, when I began working in Ajami uh, archives of Africa, I did not have many supporters. Uh, the few people who supported me were uh, Professor David Robinson and Professor John Hanwick. Uh, late Professor Hanwick. So I'm very grateful to them for supporting this scholarship uh, that has made it possible to uh, uh, make Ajami that was invisible visible now. So what I want to do is to uh, share with you uh, what we have uncovered in Ajami traditions of Africa uh, that will help us go beyond notions of oral traditions of Africa as the only source of knowledge about Africa. Uh, there's a tendency to overemphasize oral traditions of Africa as if they're not all the written traditions of Africa that are indigenous. And when we go beyond that, we realize that there are insights in sources written in African languages, both in Arabic in Arabic-derived scripts, but also in all the indigenous scripts that we have not really taken advantage of. So I'm just focusing on this talk on Ajami traditions that I know better, and to see what lessons we can draw from these. 
Uh, first, the overemphasis on, on oral traditions and colonial archives in Africa have rendered largely invisible important written materials in non-Roman scripts, particularly in Muslim regions where orality and literacy have been interlaced for centuries. Where do you draw the line? When a poem is chanted and it's also written, is this a written document? Is this an oral document? Those dichotomies do not hold when you subject them to data in the African context. Because oral and written traditions in these cultures are interlaced. They're not mutually exclusive. These written materials and non -Roman, in non-Roman scripts and those yet to be unearthed produced by people that Usman Khan refers to as non-Europhone African intellectuals can significantly enhance teaching and research in Africa. If we begin to take into account the writings of non-Europhone Africans, Africans who have written in languages that are not French, English, Portuguese, we can have access to new sorts of insight that reveal local voices that we did not have access to. So in this talk, I will focus on the Ajami archives of Africa that I know better. First, what is Ajami? I don't, I'm not gonna bore you with the long history of the word, but suffice it to say that it comes from the Arabic word non-Arab, and it had pejorative meaning in the same way as barbarian had a pejorative meaning. And later the word referred to Persians who were the non-Arabs close to the Arabs. <laughs> and the word evolved later to mean the writing of African languages with modified Arabic script. But it also means writing of any language using the modified Arabic script. And the tradition is found in Asia, uh, among the Uyghurs in China, uh, in, in, in Europe, Portuguese and uh, Spanish, La Literatura, Al Hamiyada, it's the same process. Ajami has played a significant role in the spread of Islam across Sub-Saharan Africa and indeed around the world. But Ajami documents do not only deal with religious issues. Ajami documents deal with religious and non-religious issues because people's lives are not only about religion. <laughs> people are interested in love, relationships, in business, in their horses and farms, and they document those with the writing system they have. Right? What is Ajami? I treat Ajami as an enrichment of the Arabic script with what? With very powerful dots. I call them the powerful dots. <laughs> because these dots are so important because they add and increase the number of consonants that are possibly, uh, 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 that could be possibly written. Arabic does not have these consonants. Arabic does not have P, does not have G, does not have Ny, does not have all of these consonants. These are features of Senegambia, West Atlantic languages. So you will find uh, in many names, actually many last names, you will find Ngom, Dur, Mbai, uh, etc. How do you write these when they do not exist in Arabic? So what the Wolof did for P and the Pular, they take the Ba and they add three dots on top. Sometimes these three dots could be below. What matters is that there are three dots. <laughs> so I call them the powerful dots. <laughs> because it is about the dots in general in Ajami traditions, the letters of the Arabic system remain the same. Whether it's in China, in Andalus, in, 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 in uh, uh, East Africa and West Africa, it's always about the dots. <laughs> How many dots? One dot, two dots. Where are you gonna place the dots? And that's how they have been able to write consonants that did not exist, as they were following, in the Arabic alphabet. So this is clearly an enrichment, okay? and these are tangible forms of enrichment. In the same way the Latin script spread through Christianity, 
So too, the Arabic script spread through Islam and was modified to write numerous languages around the world. Most of these Ajami traditions initially emerged as part of the pedagogies to disseminate Islam to illiterate masses. Uh, here we recall the work of uh, Nana Asmau, Usman Danfodio, and many other uh, people who have written Ajami to engage the masses. Recent evidence indicates that the orthography, the Arabic orthography itself, developed from patterns observed in Ajami traditions. In other words, the powerful dots were also what produced what we know as the Arabic scriptures <laughs> from Aramaic. According to Daniel, this is a good work, the existing corpus of pre-Islamic Arabic language inscriptions dated from 328 and 568 were written in number 10, early Arabic script. According to him, the Arabic orthography developed from the Nabataean Arabs who modified Aramaic script with diacritics, the powerful dots, mm -hmm. to represent their sounds that did not exist in Aramaic, a process that continues in Ajami traditions around the world. So who owns the script is a difficult question to answer. <laughs> okay. Do the Wolof own the script? <laughs> Do the Arab own the script? the Aramaic own the script? That's a complicated question to answer. Okay. This is a good resource for those interested in fine-grained details on how the Arabic orthography itself emerged. Uh, Daniels, Peter, uh, the type of Arabic script. This is a good, very good volume. I think it's a very good volume and that shows Ajami uh, forms in different parts of the world. To give you a rough visual uh, uh, image of the distribution of the Arabic script and Arabic so you can have a sense of the, uh, the scope. Uh, this map uh, reflects places in Africa and around the world where you have presence of Arabic and Arabic script uh, documents. In Africa, there are about 80 languages that have been written with records of Ajumi from east to west uh, of different, with different contents. Now the big problem is Ajami literates are excluded in official literacy statistics. If you take the example of the United States, United Nations adult literacy rates for Senegal, Niger, and Guinea, for Senegal, in 2006, according to the United Nations Adult Literacy Rates, the rate for Senegal was 42%. For Niger in 2005, it was 29%. For Guinea, it was 38% in 2008. Okay. Yet, according to CSE 2003, uh, it's, a limited, it's a limited census. There's not really a general census, but it's a limited census that gives us a, a sense of the widespread grassroots literacy in Ajumi. So he conducted, <coughs> he reports on a <coughs> limited census conducted in Labe, Jurbel, Matam, Podor in Senegal, Labe in Guinea, and Niger and Nigeria, especially in northern Nigeria, uh, reveals the following. In the Labe area, there are over 70% Ajami literacy rates. And among, uh, among women, there's even 20 to 25%. This is important and this is well founded because of the centrality of Quranic education in Futa Jalon. For anyone who knows the pearls of Futa Jalon, uh, education, Islamic Quranic education, is very important. And for Jurbel, Matam, and Podor, in the Tukulur area, the Futa Tora area, and uh, the Wall of areas of the Bawal, the birthplace of the Muridia, uh, there's about 70% Ajami literacy. In Hausa area of Niger and Nigeria, there's about 80% of Ajami literacy. So, the definition of literacy that we have 
excludes and has excluded millions of people who have been reading and writing in Ajumi, in Wolof Hausa, and their languages, and who have actually produced more books than us, and who sell them in markets, what Henrik referred to as the market editions. You could buy them for uh, uh, saint saint Francs in Senegal, one dollar. African Ajami literates are generally misrepresented in official literary statistics because literacy is defined as the ability to read and write in European languages and the ability to use the Roman script. So if this definition applied to African context, it renders millions of people illiterate. <laughs> illiterate. This narrow colonial understanding of literacy, unfortunately, was, was espoused by African governments, post-colonial African governments, and, interna and international organizations. And they continue to exclude millions of Ajami literates in Africa. So when you hear Francophone Africa, Anglophone Africa, uh, Lusophone Africa, go to the market and see if your French or your English or your Portuguese is gonna help you in the market to bargain. <laughs> Go to the rural areas. And these people who have been exposed to the Arabic script as, as a Quranic uh, school student, many of them drop out. They become shopkeepers, they become merchants, they become, the only writing system they have is Ajumi. So was my dad. To give you a sense of what we were missing when we exclude, when we render these people illiterate, inside that we were missing, I have looked at our Ajami Digital Library at Boston University, uh, which now has over 30,000 pages of Ajami materials in Wolof, Hausa, uh, Malagasy, in Madagascar, Sorabe, uh, uh, Pular, Futajalo, and we're building, uh, we're adding Nupe and all the languages. When I look at the content of those materials, this is what I found. Talismanic protective devices, documents dealing with astrology, divination, documents dealing with religious and didactic uh, materials in poetry and prose, elegies, translations of works on Islamic metaphysics, tasawuf, uh, Sufism, uh, jurisprudence, fiqh, Translation of the Quran from Arabic into African languages, secular writings such as commercial and administrative record keeping, family genealogies, records of important local events such as foundation of villages, births, death, weddings, biographies, political and social satires, advertisements, road signs, public announcements, speeches, personal correspondences, traditional treatment of illnesses, medicinal plants, incantations, history, local customs and ancestral traditions, and texts on diplomatic matters, behavioral codes, and grammar. Aren't we missing a lot when we exclude these people in our production of knowledge about Africa? This is what I call the linguistic paradox in academia. While it is unthinkable to study America without speaking English, and reading documents in English, while it is unthinkable to study France without using French and reading French documents, it is perfectly normal to study African countries without speaking their languages, without reading their, their documents. I think it's time to change that in the generation of the new students here, because you will have access to more information than us. I wish I knew these things when I was a student, <laughs> when I was a student. Multilingualism and multiliteracy is to show you a sample document. Uh, this was digitized in our recent project in the Mandinka areas of Kazamas, in the Seju area. Part of the pedagogy is, is to ask a student to make a copy of the manuscripts they will be working on. These are advanced students. 
They make a copy of the manuscript and then come meet the teacher and they go through each letter and each word and they will comment on it. The documents can vary from a hundred to a thousand pages. And these comments, this document is in Arabic. The teacher has asked him to write a poem ending with da. You can see the da, the da, the da, the da, the da. But then in the comments, the teacher has asked him to make spaces so he can fill them up with comments. These comments can be in Arabic or in Mandinka or in Soninke, depending on the language on instruct of instruction he taught him in that concept. If the teacher has explained to you this concept from a Pular teacher who came by and, and taught me this concept and I taught you this in Pular, the comment may be in Pular. If the content was taught to him in, in reference to a Wolof or in reference to a Soninke, the IGME might be in Soninke or Wolof. So you end up having a text that has multiple languages as part of their pedagogies. What's interesting, the Arabic script that is used here is not the modern standard Arabic. It's a classical form of Arabic based on the Qiraat of Al-Warsh. For those who know the Quran has seven reciters. In the recitations of the Quran, <clears throat> one of the reciters called Warsh spoke a different dialect of Arabic and the dialectal features of his pronunciation are reflected in his writing. And it's that base of classical Arabic that has been modified in West Africa, enriched for Mandinka, Wolof, Hausa, etc. So what it means, if you are modern standard Arabic, <laughs> you may be facing difficulties reading this text because modern standard Arabic is based on hafs, not wash. Uh, this is a field work, um, our field work team digitizing a document uh, in a family. Uh, the diversity of scholars, the Ajami scholars are very diverse. These are true groups <coughs> that I have found. There's one group I call the social scientists, and the second group I call the esoteric scholars, and the third group I call the poets and singers. Of course, this division is not meant to be a generalization. It is intended to reflect the major trends I have observed in the work of the scholars I know. Because social, social science scholars are those who really do field work like us. They travel. They gather information. They analyze the information. They, foot, they give footnotes and references. They rank the credibility of their sources in many ways just like social scientists. And then you have esoteric scholars who are more interested in astrology, uh, numerology, uh, metaphysics. And then you have poets and singers who verbalize written documents. Okay. So where do you draw the line between oral and written again? Uh, most written documents are also verbalized and verbalized documents, verb speeches are also written. So where do you draw the line between oral and written? It's complicated. It's better to understand them as complementary and interlaced. Of course, you have people who are, whose major interest is to <laughs> conduct research on the Kabu Empire, for example. I just discovered one scholar who conducted extensive research and has constructed uh, the history of the Kabu Empire. But he's also a poet. <laughs> yeah. From time to time, he writes poetry. Okay. This is one of the scholars in the Murid tradition whose small book is one of the most read among the Muridia. His name is Mahmoud Nyang. And he wrote a book called Jarjaru Boromtuba. And this is very popular, and it gives you an internal history of the Muridia based on Murid's pers perspectives, which is very interesting 
In fact, my book drew from this. And it was so interesting because the story and the narratives here complement what we know about the Murids. To give you a sense of the content, these are, these are what I called, uh, what Henrik, uh, Professor John Henrik called um, market editions. You could buy them in the markets, <laughs> like this I bought in the market. But let's look at the content of the book. Who is Khadi Murasul? Uh, this is Bamba, the rules of the Murid will. The traits of Boromtuwa, this is interesting. The description of Shah Muru Bamba here complements the only picture that exists of him. If you're a good artist, you could actually draw uh, a, 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 a picture uh, that complements the only picture we have of him. Uh, I know the scholar, Abi Bunyang, Abi Busi, excuse me, wrote Lautan Ukbarke, Duwone Seti Mamarambake. That's again Wolof. But what's interesting here is for historians, is in you will see that in the cover page, he will write that the grandfather was born in Aikashi and died in Sanyanja in Yurushi. These two words do not mean anything in Wolof. They date. Many, many, many have been misled to believe that this is gibberish, when in reality, this is a chronogram based on a, on a correspondence between letters and numbers. So the year is based on a consonantal system. The year stands for 10, the k stands for 100, the sh for 1,000. That gives you 1,110 Anum Hijra, the Muslim calendar. The death date, the year, R and Sh. Again, the year gives you 10, the R 200, the Sh 1,000, gives you 1,012, 10. If you convert this to the Gregorian calendar, it gives you that he was born in 110 Anum Hijra and died in 1210, corresponding to 1698. 1795 Christian era. He lived close to 100 years. It shows the potential contribution of Ajimi sources in the field of African historiography. And this dating system of chronograms is not only limited to the Wolof, it's found in the Hausa, the Kanuri, the Mandinka, it's widespread. You may find words that look like gibberish, but in reality they date. They dates using a chronogram where there is a correspondence between numbers and letters. This could help enrich African history. The other part where these numbers are used is in the science of numerology, which involves a lot of mathematical skills, which is used for ast in astrology and divination, which is also used in medicinal treatments, your names could be converted in numbers, and those numbers have to match the letters perfectly because of the belief that the language of the divine is, it has a perfect mathematical harmony between letters and numbers. So when you go to a marabou and they ask you what's your name, it's very likely they will convert it into this system to be able to know what's appropriate treatment for you. And so they play two functions. The gender dimension is not only men who have written. Among the Murids, son of Maimune Tumbake, the youngest daughter of Amadou Bamba, is remembered in her community as a loving mother and a teacher, poetess and moral exemplar following the lines and traditions of Nana Asmau, that I'm sure many of you know. And between 1974 and 1975, she wrote a popular Ajami poem in which she presents her condolences to her husband and her family for her own daughter they lost at a young age. So she lost her daughter. It's a moving poem, regularly read and recited in all of communities. It's a very, very moving poem. I have a student who is now working on this. Uh, I hope she will uh, write something new. 
There are also ephemeral texts <coughs> that teach uh, uh, ethics, moral, moral values, and they circulate in the neighborhoods. They're usually copied and distributed. They're usually also recited and memorized. And they usually function with maxims that could be remembered very easily. Seven things are better than seven things. <laughs> you could remember that. And the first one, to stop lying is better than studying the Quran and knowledge and living by it. To stop lying is very important. <laughs> Controlling your seven senses, sight, smell, touch, taste, hearing, mind, and heart is better than fasting continuously. <laughs> Remembering the afterlife is better than night-long prayers. Being generous to people is better than waging holy war. To stop immoral acts is better than repenting endless, endlessly. I like to tell this to my friends. <laughs> <laughs> Giving good advice is better than numerous alms. Prohibiting immoral acts is better than seeking God's help continuously. Okay? So these are memorized and are recited and chanted, but they're also written again. Okay. You see the complementarity yeah. between kinship and elasticity of ethnicity in Ajami documents. I know many anthropologists and linguists, I, I spend time arguing with my colleagues, ethnicity is a source of major problem in Africa. Well, it's not always the case everywhere in Africa. You can't generalize. It is true in some parts of Africa, ethnicity has been politicized. But ethnicity has also been very flexible, very elastic in many parts of Africa. I'm an example of it. My dad is Serer, my mom is half Pular, half Serer. I was born and raised in Kazamas. <laughs> I'm everything. <laughs> okay. And this text is a rich document that shows the genealogy, the changing of ethnicity of the Mbake family from the 17th to the mid 20th century. And it uh, describes the maternal and paternal lineages of Amadou Bamba, the founder of the Muridia. It traces it to the Fulani roots in Futa Toro, to the family's full Wolofization, including the first person who became fully Wolofized and only spoke Wolof. <laughs> You see how ethnicity in this case, you know, is, is flexible. I know the area where Ajami is used is not only uh, religious, it's also in medicine, local medicine. So this is an excerpt from a table of content which is on our website, uh, the African Ajami Library. 42, Louis Fad Sachent. Louis Fad Sachent. Louis Fad Tawati Bud. Jumaner Don, Louis Fag Tawati Sad, Louis Fag Tawati Beer, Louis Fag Tawati Bop, etc., etc. Healing varicella, healing any type of eye pain, healing rheumatism, healing stomachache, healing headache, healing sore throat, healing toothache, healing someone who can urinate, benefit of the parrot's tongue for healing children with speech disorder. Now, I haven't tried any of these yet, but... Uh, <laughs> Ajami in pre-colonial diplomacy. I found this document in Aix-en-Provence, the archives in France, in Aix-en-Provence. But what's interesting about this is that it shows that in the initial encounters between Europeans and Africans, lo local literacy forms in Ajami were recognized. <laughs> And diplomatic documents have been produced when the balance of power was about the same. <laughs> but as soon as the balance of power shifts, the descendants of the King Bar are all illiterate now. <laughs> it's interesting. I all treat it as illiterate. This document was written when the King of France, Louis XVIII, was looking for trading opportunities on the Gambia River and encountered King of Bar and was asked uh, to draft uh, a proposition uh, of the trading post that he wanted. 
And the king of France asked his, dictated to his scribe his proposition. The king of Bar responded, asked his scribe, described his response to the king of France's proposition. So the two documents are juxtaposed as legal documents representing the agreements between the two rulers. Interestingly, this phrase has misled many scholars because this is in Arabic, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. These formulaic phrases are often found in Ajami documents because when Muslims write, even if they're writing about the horse they lost, they may begin with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim in good Arabic. And the rest may be Wolof, maybe Hausa, maybe Mandinka. So many scholars who can read this, but lack the wall of linguistic skills, will treat this as undecipherable Arabic or bad Arabic, when in reality it is not Arabic. It's Mandinka, it's Wolof, it's Pular, it's, it's another language. In any case, and the fact that there is only Bismillah Rahman Rahim doesn't necessarily mean that the rest of the text is about religion. In this case, about business. Okay. And so, the use of Ajami is also documented in many parts of Africa, including in East Africa. There's a good uh, MA thesis that was produced by a student uh, uh, documenting the Swahili Ajami being used in the uh, eastern part of Africa, including in Mozambique, uh, in treaties uh, between merchants and uh, uh, local rulers, and communication even with the Portuguese uh, colonial uh, powers in, Mo in Mozambique. So, it's why. But Ajami is not only the thing of the elite. It's also used by the masses. This is an advertisement in a local village. And you find these when you travel in the villages, eh? in Dufuta, in uh, Baol, and you find these because this is how the, but they, the literacy form they have. And this one says, Serene Lord Dam is a healer and a fortune teller. Anything you want is available at, he, at this location. Your problem will be resolved, God willing. Serene Lord is very knowledgeable. He is not well known, but he is now doing well. The distance to his place is 500. Clearly, this, this guy is advertising his, 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 <laughs> advertising his business here. Cell phone companies, while governments continue to ignore these Ajami users, French companies like Orange, they know there's money to be made here. And to engage the, to sell their product in the Jurbel area where there are a lot of Murids who are literate in Ajami, they use Ajami. And this one says, uh, water to call, mess missiles, message, internet. Huh? And they even, use a local closing uh, to attract, to market their businesses. Uh, I just got received this from, our, uh, from one of my colleagues in northern Nigeria. Uh, this is an Ajami Nupe uh, in political campaigns. And uh, this is very recent, showing how Ajami is used in different fields. Uh, so in this case, it's saying vote president 2019. Uh, let's vote for a credible president for change. For those who always tell me Ajami is always about religion, follow, stop about this Ajami thing, I have this counter example for them. This is a wall of Ajami sign, warning sign, saying urinating prohibited at this place. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, the person who wrote this was targeting a particular group <laughs> and they, they, they figured using Ajami would be more effective here. Then you interact with yourself. But Ajami is also used as a foreign language teaching tool. This is a document in Pular. Uh, David Glovsky and Professor David Robinson are working in an Ajami project in the NEH and they're responsible for a polar. Maybe David, this is something we could look at. Uh, this section, this guy is teaching survival French and has on this side, Français, polar, bonjour. So bonjour, 
Tana Wetali. And he has, he has basic survival French uh, phrases. Uh, and he uh, even at the end gives his phone number and address in case you need, you want to uh, learn from survival French. All of Ajumi as a critic, and a critic of the transatlantic slave trade. So this is an interesting document that I found in a poem by Mbai Jahate, who is really a social critic and attacks the Murid's the leadership and attacks anyone he thinks uh, is of course. Okay. And in this case, he treats the violence that some of the world of rulers who were involved in the trade slave uh, did as the bad investment they performed, which resulted in the fact that they did not have a beautiful ending. Mujugurafet, the very important thing in our sub-region. You would find it in many prayers. May God give us good ending. Amakji, is that not true, Grand Sal? Huh? So in this poem, he's saying the reason why these wall of rulers did not have a good ending, did not have a mujugurafet, is because of their involvement in the transatlantic slavery. And this is what he says. This world has misled many people. What are those who were kings and their servants? What are those who used to ride their horses to catch, snatch, sell, and herd slaves? Where are they? Who knows where those who used to wake up looking for slaves to sell, ravage villages, and make people cry and run away are? Who knows where those who used to beat royal junjung drums to assemble all people and who would belittle and disparage poor peoples are. See the fate of the aristocrats who used to be surrounded by crowd carrying firearms they led in wars. Where are they? What about those who used to wander and wage wars and tyrannize and share people like animals and their opportunistic servants? Where are they? What about those who would kill people and order killings while they sat above and watched with their eyes wide open, arrogantly. Where are they? What about those who used to kill each other and summon crowds who came and assembled tightly in one place to listen to their orders? Where are they? What about those who would betray each other, draw weapons against each other, and argue and get drunk? He's probably talking to the shadows around here. Uh, who knows where they are? And then, he concludes, ignoring God's injunction is unprofitable. For if you do it, you will not have a beautiful ending. Mujukrafe. No one knows where those who used to do and write with acts are. Those who were kings and their servants alike have all disappeared inside the earth. Those who were arrogant and those who were humble alike, where are they? Repent and be grateful to God and strive to obtain his endorsement. And do not ever be among those who no one knows where they are. And finally, I cannot conclude without reading this, my preferred poem, a Mandinka Ajami poem, Cursing Adolf Hitler. This poem is a war effort in uh, the Mandinka area, there is a word they call Dankaro. Dankaro is cursing. It can also mean unleashing the negative powers of words to destroy an enemy. Because there is a belief that the words of some elders are imbued with power to bless and also with the power to undermine you. In Wolof is the equivalence of Torah, eh? Dankaru. Torah. Eh? I don't know the name in Pular, Angra. What's the name in Pular? Torah, Torah, Nit. Hoinude, okay. It's the same idea. And so his community was being affected by the war. People were being drafted. And the war has, has impacted his community. And as a leader, whose students were being affected, he had to deploy his most powerful weapon, and in this case, was to curse Adolf Hitler to participate in his downfall. And they call him Ikiler. 
cursing Ikilea. Notice again, this is in good Arabic. In the name of God, the merciful, the beneficent, this is Bismillah Rahman Rahim. The rest is in Mandinka. Okay. In the name Ikilea, the German has brought evil to the world. May God take away all his evil. If he is assisted by powerful demons, may those demons be destroyed. If he is helped by his political skills, may those skills be lost for good. May God bring evil on him so that he may fear himself and his deeds. May God throw thunder on him to destroy his skull and flesh. May he be betrayed by his own doctor. May he make him drink poison until he is unconscious. May the great angel destroy his planes and make them catch fire in the air and fall. Now it's becoming localized, the effect of the war in his community. No young man is here now. You caused our people and our guests to run away. The first to run away were Arfan Jemme, Kamara, Maroon, and many others. As for Danfa, he's worried for his wife is pregnant and his children can't walk eclairs. It is very sad for him. As for Kanjame, who wept so hard until I felt sad for him. Evil is not good, Ikilair. Ikilair, may God destroy you in your protected buildings. That's the bunker. Ikilair, may you have the sickness of swelling belly and swelling genital. May you feel the agony and cry and die. I mean, I mean, may God fulfill our prayers. May the human race be saved from Ikilair's evil. You see, his concern transcends his community. Uh, is his concern, is the human race. And of course, he concludes in the name of the prophet and Sheikh Sadibu, whose curse is most feared. I'm sure in this committee, if you might ask who killed Hitler, they might think they were able, they were the one. No? <laughs> Conclusion. The bulk of these Ajami texts remain unstudied. So Africanists across the humanities and social sciences have a lot to do, and I hope some of the students here, you guys have got a lot of work to do here. Some of the recent materials we have collected include translations of the Quran in Wolof, the Bible in Hausa Ajimi, the Full Full Day Two in Hausa Ajimi, Qaddafi Propaganda Green Book in Hausa Ajimi, and fuller and Mandinka texts that bear striking similarities with those produced by enslaved Africans in the Americas. I look forward to having a dissertation or a student who will use Ajami sources and uh, from contemporary uh, Ajami sources in Africa, compare them with archives that have been uncovered in the Americas. And I mean the United States, Brazil, Trinidad, and Jamaica. Uh, I think it would be, would, be, would be fantastic. These materials, when seriously studied, will enhance our understanding of various aspects of Islam in Africa, pre-colonial, colonial, and post-colonial Africa. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to ask the question. That's great. <laughs> the rest of my... <sighs> I'm Jason. I'm a Jason? linguistics PhD student. Oh, linguistics. Great. I really enjoyed what you shared. I wanted to ask you about the numbers. Uh -huh. The numbers. I thought that was very interesting. I wondered if... Well, a couple things. Um, I presume they would always go from small to large, right? Because that's what you showed were... Um, kind of, a, it looked like it was um, like a ten, then a hundred, then a thousand. Yeah. Yeah. I wondered then, is it always the same string of letters, uh, or is good. it does it vary yeah. kind of even the string of yeah. letters that was used, and that's what maybe caused further yeah, confusion system. about yeah. that. Good. Well, the the truth is, for the wall of, uh, I think it goes from the from the lowest to the highest, but I can't make a generalization in the region. Okay. So the pattern that is observed that I just showed is usually J session, bump session, thumb session. So it's usually smaller numbers to the higher numbers. But in Mandinka, they may use a different system. It may be reversed. 
Okay, uh, the Hausa, it may be a different system. But the bottom line is what, what they share, that they share the equivalencies. So the Ya has the same value in all of them. This is a good project uh, linguistically. So com comparative study of the chronogram uh, systems. Another element besides the, the, the understanding this system, how they operate in the Mandenko world, the wall of wood, diachronic studies. Some of these texts capture wall of Mandinka and Pular of the 19th, 18th century. <laughs> yeah. And so if you want to see actually wall of as spoken in the 19th century or Pular as you spoke in the 19th century or House as spoken in the 19th these are mines. They have so many words in these texts that are actually not used now because they have been, they have grammar. Mm. Uh, for wall of speakers, one hand, Ben Loho, in the traditional wall of Two hands in Yari Yoho. Yoho. Huh? Now, the rule has completely changed. Say Nyari Loho. When in the past, it's actually Nyari Yoho. Ben but Nyari Gut. Huh? So they use actually one of those uh, rules that completely changed. And so, another area that you might be interested in looking into is language evolution for anthropologists and other related areas is that social changes, environmental changes, for those in public health, public health changes and issues are also captured in these documents. Preoccupations of the 19th century, the people who were concerned about the plague, hernia. You can track the history of concerns in public health through these documents. You can also track environmental change, including the animals that existed I just, from the text of Mbai Jahate, I can tell the types of lions that used to exist in the area. He would, in some of his prayers, he would pray for, may this type of lion never come to my house. <laughs> <laughs> and they had names for these different types of animals. There's one poem, in fact, of Mbai Musaka in, on, on Jurbel in the 19, um, uh, during the time of Ahmadu Bamba's residence there, so around 1920. It's an, it's an environmental poem because Bamba wanted to know what are the plants in this space. So he wrote a poem that captured all the plants that existed in the area. So these are minds of sources for anthropologists, linguists, you know, uh, that I think uh, the key is literacy to these languages. Yeah. You're gonna have to study Wolof and then uh, know the basic system and go to these societies. But once you have access to it, I think it's the mind that could help, you know. Uh, so thanks for the great question. Thank you. Uh -huh. Let's uh, follow up. Nice hey, to see you again. How, about, how are you? <laughs> Salam. Assalamu uh -huh. I have the privilege to learn about this book for the past 10 years because you have been working with my friend Mustafa, yes. who is in Bayro University, Kano. Yes. And he's still working on this uh, medical project, I yes. think, uh, the handbook for the Northern yes. Nigeria. Mm -hmm. uh, my question today is, uh, you are trying to revive this uh, culture of literacy and knowledge across at least the Muslim West African uh, countries that you are covering with this academic work. Uh, to what extent do you think uh, the buy-in of uh, local governments in terms of uh, young people to know about this uh, depository of uh, knowledge because I grew up seeing people who are very elderly writing in Ajami. That's right. And the evidences in Meduguri, in Kano, That's in right. Sokoto, mm -hmm. is very clear, even with the signage and everything. You mm -hmm. don't need to go very far. But it's mostly with the elderly. People. That's right. Young people like me, we can read, but we cannot decipher as much to the depth that you are going. So yeah. how do you think this uh, effort can also be let me say, both in by the locals yeah. for the young generation. That's the, that's the most difficult question. <laughs> the challenge is that, uh, I mean, if, if, if you think that the case in uh, Nigeria is harder, go French to French-speaking Africa. Mm. The, uh, the notion of Europhone definition of literacy has been so entrenched that working with Senegalese government or educators to make them understand the value of these is a difficult process. So what I do, I have actually avoided working with them 
because they undermine you. I have been asked, I have been asked, well, why do you want us to go back to la préhistoire? Alors que nous, nous voulons nous développer. Mais fallu, mais arrête ton ami. Because they don't see the value. Because for them, the model of reference is French and the French uh, uh, educational system, which has made these systems invisible. So, my hope is, uh, and then now we have internet, if I can access the internet. What's interesting, as we're now putting these things online, I can see the downloads now from Senegal going up. <laughs> so it means people are beginning to use these sources. Okay. So I, I think that and Nigerians actually are using the, uh, the Mustafa sources, uh, the Hausa ones that he put. The most downloaded one is uh, the recipes for winning court, uh, court cases, being popular and famous from Mustafa's collection. And these downloads come from Nigeria. <laughs> So I think for me, the best approach is the bottom up. And that is, we do our job very well, and then we show, we make them accessible, okay? rather than approaching these local governments. Because once you approach the local government, you get into the bureaucracy, and I don't think it's, we would, we would not be able to produce what we have produced with the help of Mustafa. Mustafa has been phenomenal. If we relied on, say, the permission of a uh, local office, uh, it's not going to work. Okay. So it's a real challenge, and I think the challenge is actually more difficult in the Francophone world. And uh, my hope is that as we continue to train new generation of students who can access this information and begin to write on them, on these sources, and make these sources accessible online, I think this government will change, will catch up later when the masses, you know, have, have accepted. But the other way, will bog you down, you're not gonna go anywhere. And then I want to say Mustafa just completed collecting uh, 1,000 page of full full day in Kanuri, 1,000 page of uh, Nupe in um, uh, Yoruba Ajemi uh, that we will be uploading very soon. So he's a, uh, Dr. Dr. Kurfi is doing very well. And we hope you will contribute too very soon, huh? Inshallah. So Mara Lightman, okay. Anthropology, Mara? welcome. I want to follow up on this debate about mm -hmm. uh, statistics and literacy yes. rates. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you had any sense, and I know these numbers are really hard to come by, mm -hmm. whether literacy in Ajami is increasing or decreasing over the past century, half a century or so, and whether that correlates to an increase in literacy in European languages. And also if you could address the politics of these literacy rates where mm -hmm. I'm assuming governments as well as the international NGO community depend often on yes. literacy rates based on European yes. languages right. for development serv uh, services and sure. aid, and whether there might be some politics by African That's governments in not pushing to yeah. increase the That's definition great. of yeah. literacy. Good point. Well, thank you very much, Mara. It's a wonderful question. Yeah, so the first challenge we face is that we don't have, as you pointed out, broad statistics. The only one we have is the one from CC, uh, and it's limited. But the truth is, because the government's inability to have French schools, for example, in rural areas, the only schools you have are chronic schools. <laughs> so the rate of literacy in rural areas in Ajami remains higher than, in, at least in Muslim areas. But you have hubs where the rate is actually increasing in the Murid areas, in the Jurbel area, in the Tuba area, because the Murids have em embraced technology. So they, might, they make these copies, these um, market edition copies are available. And then I just received, uh, today is the muggle, I just received some text, uh, now I have turned everybody into an agemist, uh, pictures of, um, uh, 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 you know, of, of uh, advertisements in Ajumi, uh, so, like uh, you can see, so uh, the, the, in these areas, it's, it's, it's still, it's still Ajami remains, you know, more dominant. In urban areas, I don't think so. In urban areas, I think the Latin script is more dominant because you have more uh, presence of Western schools and functional literacy programs that you usually have have offices in urban areas and operate in rural areas. 
Uh, I think that in northern Nigeria, it's safe to say, uh, in northern Nigeria, in Niger, uh, in um, uh, one of areas, and Futa Jalon, it's fair to say that the Ajami rate is higher. Okay? Uh, I don't think it's the same in, uh, in, uh, in Zigan Shore, for example. Okay? Because the ethnic politics in Zigan Shore is very mixed uh, in the city of Zigan Shore. So the Ajami rates in Mandinka there may be smaller. But outside of Zigan Shore, in the Seju areas, where it's the heartland of the Mandinka, Ajami is, 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 uh, would be higher. It's, it's, uh, I think it would be interesting to have a large scale uh, census uh, uh, for the entire Muslim areas. Uh, to have a better sense. But I suspect that the rural areas where you still have dominance of Quranic schools, Ajami is, is very important. And the, these politicians make advertisements in Ajami uh, because they understand. Okay. The politics of literacy, as, uh, I suspect that there are issues there because I asked one time the former minister of Senegal, uh, uh, minister of foreign affairs, Gajo, when he came to BU, uh, why don't you recognize Ajimi? Well, he told me, me donc nous on sera des illettrés. Yeah. So that means we would become illiterate ourselves. <laughs> okay. And I think there is that part too. Because once you recognize Ajami literacy as a form of literacy that is grassroots and widespread, that means the teachers themselves have to retool. <laughs> yeah. Have to be retained. So the entire infrastructure has to be uh, redone. And, and I think that's, that's probably one of the problems. Uh, and I don't know how to go about it. I know that in the Ajami uh, uh, world of the Muris and uh, Hausa, they have developed a very rich infrastructure, printing presses, market copies, singers and reciters who have become wealthy, by the, by the way. In fact, becoming a copyist, uh, because it's, you're making copies, you're selling them, you're bringing money, uh, writing letters for people who did live in the villages. It's, it's a booming business. Okay. So it may not affect negatively if Ajami was to be incorporated in the, into the uh, alphabetization functionnel or the public school. It's not may affect negatively it could be not abuses, but I think uh, the, the, the system may be affected, and that may be one of the reasons that... Uh, uh, the interest in Ajami is not uh, very strong, especially among the elite. Uh, but that's an area that deserves a lot of attention. But uh, I think it would be good to hear the view of uh, Le Professor uh, Sal, who is here, and who might uh, have insight on this particular issue. Uh, very fluent in English. Okay. So, je voulais savoir votre, votre avis par rapport à la question qu'elle a posée. C'est-à-dire, euh, si l'Ajami était reconnu comme un système, comme, comme le, 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 le niveau de, de literacy, euh, de la capacité de lire et d'écrire en Ajami était reconnu, est-ce qu'il n'y a pas une dimension politique qui décourage cela parce que ça aurait eu des impacts sur le système de, de, de dédication qu'ils ont chez eux Bien sûr. Effectivement, ça peut créer des problèmes. Mais il, faut, il faut quand même il faut savoir que le recensement du Sénégal prend en charge ceux qui peuvent utiliser les caractères arabisés, comme Adjemi. Ça, c'est le recensement. Les derniers recensements prennent en charge cela. Pas comme on voudrait, mais bon. Il y, a, il y a quand même quelques questions qui sont relatives à cela. Effectivement, il n'y a pas une volonté politique. C'est compréhensible. Nous sommes un pays dit francophone. Mais c'est l'État qui est francophone, ce n'est pas le pays. Ouais. C'est l'État du Sénégal qui est francophone. Le pays n'est pas francophone. Ils ont du mal. Nous sommes autour de 13% de francophones. Ouais. Par la définition même de, 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 de l'AUF, hein? moins de 13% environ. Donc le reste n'est pas francophone. Effectivement, il y a des espaces pour la JAMI et... et est toujours euh, utilisé. Ça, il faut le savoir, vous l'avez dit, là où l'enseignement coranique est de mise, mm -hmm. forcément, ceux qui sont 
former un Coran, ça veut dire les lettres ouais. pour l'utilisation. Le, C'est ça aussi la force. Euh, mais l'avenir, comme vous l'avez dit, n'est pas facile à envisager parce que la volonté politique n'est pas là, c'est sûr. Et qu'il y a une offensive de la France politique, c'est sûr aussi. Mais il faut savoir que aussi ceux qui prônent les langues nationales sont là. Mais en caractère, malheureusement, ah ouais. ils n'ont pas pris en charge ce caractère. Mais l'USAID qui finance, par exemple, la lecture pour tous actuellement, mm -hmm. ils, ils utilisent la méthode des foyers d'enseignement coranique, mm -hmm. c'est-à-dire apprendre par la langue locale. Ce qu'ils ont essayé d'utiliser maintenant, mais avec le caractère latin. Mais avec les, avec des caractères latins. Vous voyez, ils s'inspirent de ce qui se faisait depuis longtemps pour promouvoir la lecture ah ouais. pour tous. Voilà ce que je vais okay. dire. Merci beaucoup. Ben, elle parle français, je pense. Mm -hmm. Je suis d'accord. So. C'est une question difficile. C'est une difficult question. And um, I had a one time. Uh, there was an effort in the 1980s of standardizing the Ajami writing systems by Isesco. Isesco said, you know, uh, I'm code switching here. Isesco is an organization um, uh, like UNESCO for the Arab world. And they attempted to standardize Ajami writings. And what they did was they used. Farsi and Urdu letters and try to teach those letters to the Quranic teachers. It did not work. What happened, they spent a lot of money and they organized workshops and they produced documents. These are the documents at the Minister, the, the Direction of Alphabetization. The P is a, is a Farsi P. So they used the money and the resources When they went back, they continued to write in their own Ajami tradition. So I think, I think la volonté politique, as you say, is not there. Uh, so it's a difficult question. Thank you Follow for a really interesting sure. talk. Uh, I have a lot to think about. Um, I would like to ask a question relative to something that uh, our friend Zal just said. In terms of the competition now with the Latin script, mm -hmm. you also see in Senegal a lot of signs written in Wolof or Pula sure. or other languages in the Latin script. And the government has done a lot of like literacy campaigns around the Latin script. Um, and in my experience, like even some people are using social media in the Latin yep. script. I haven't seen anyone using it in Ajami, but also my networks aren't really with the Morids. Um, so if you could talk about the sort of competition, if you will, And there's also no real standardization of the Latin script with these languages as well. If you just want to expand yeah. on that, I would yeah. love to hear your yeah. thoughts. So the issue of standardization, even with the Latin script, the standardization, the, the, there are only few people who are literally in Latin script. Mm -hmm. The majority, they use French to write Latin script, to write Wolof. Yes. Kur, uh, it's a lot of mistakes. Uh, it's K, they write K-E-U-R, which is incorrect. Our wall, of, our wall of students here, that's a triste aussi. No, our wall of students in America write better wall of than the majority of Senegalese. C'est la vérité, mais c'est triste. Eh? C'est pas vrai, c'est vrai. Uh, nos étudiants ici, our students here, are taught elementary, who take elementary wall of at Boston University or here, they write better wall of than the journalists, the best journalists. Uh, re recently, I didn't want to bring that up, in the context of the, of the conversation on L'Histoire du Sénégal. I received few pages of L'Histoire du Sénégal, and the few pages, few lines that are written in Wolof are written with a French-based system. New with G-N-O-U. Okay, so the point is, the standardization issue was primarily for functional literacy purposes. Literacy that is used For, the, for women in the rural areas and to help men, functional literacy, and that are funded by the government. And if they use the Latin script, they use it for agriculture, for small organizations, and that's about it. There's not really a competition because the Murid world where Ajami is used or the Pular world where Ajami is used, uh, these, are, these are continuation of, of, of traditions and networks. So when you write a letter to your uncle in the village who only reads in Pular Ajami, there's not a whole lot of options you have there. <laughs> okay. uh, in the Murid context where you have online, Ajami is actually, I didn't touch on that in the conversation. 
There's a phenomenon that I call murid, no, 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 not murid, music-derived literacy. The relationship between music and literacy. Many of the poems are heard and synchronized online with the text. So that you can see the text timeline being played while you're listening, right? That's playing a significant role on, online, in Murid networks, and I suspect in Hausa, where you listen to a poem and then you see the text. It's timeline. Okay? So for the diaspora, that's significant. It creates connections with local communities, and people who have not been able, who are not literate actually at home, are acquiring both Arabic literacy and Ajami literacy by listening to these poems and then seeing the letters. <laughs> I have a friend in New York, Jibi Jan, who's actually developed literacy in Arabic and Ajami through these poems that are extensive in the, uh, uh, in the, in, in the World Wide Web, uh, the, the, the multimedia. So uh, I, I think that Ajami is actually one thing that we know for sure that Quranic schools as being the base through which Ajami is acquired as a byproduct. I think we need to add a, a new layer, which is digital media. The role that digital media is actually playing, especially in the diaspora, uh, where actually people uh, do listen to Ajami texts and see them and are acquiring more Ajami literacy as they listen to Arabic text, the text of Bamba online, and then see uh, the text itself and listen to it. So these are new channels that brings us to a more theoretical question, and that is the, the assumption that literacy is only acquired, is first and primarily acquired through visual representation. In this case, it's actually through hearing first. Uh, when people memorize these beautiful poems and they're drawn to these poems because of the beauty, uh, and it's only after that that they learn the script. Okay? So we have here really a complementarity between visual and hearing in this context. An area open for research for you guys. Huh? Great question. Thanks. Yes. Hi. Uh, my name is uh, Abdulaziz. Abdulaziz, okay. I'm from Saudi Arabia. Okay. And I live by born in Kuwait. Okay. So I have a question about like a school. I don't take you back like to the government. So my question is that like I know that like a lot of people like in Kuwait and Saudi Arabia and uh, like they give a lot of money like to the people in your country like they pay like for the building uh, building the mosque. Mosque, mm -hmm. yeah mosque and for the water but my question is that like have you tried like to let them know like you guys not just need down like you guys need to tell them like you need guys school because if the people get knowledge have uh, been studying get educated they can't control the country, like the country. They can't control. They can change the government. They can do the better for the uh, country. But like my question, uh, because even like my uh, my one of my uh, cousins he died, and my family they like pay a lot of money to build like uh, water for some uh, uh, village, small, small village, because they don't have water just to help. Like because okay. the guy he's dead. Sure. Like this hasn't. Like, yeah. You know what it's mean. You know what it. Is. Yeah. But like, why, why don't you like, have you tried like, to send a message like, to, the, to these people like, okay. you guys need school, you guys need uh, educated, because you said like we you don't have like a lot of school, right? Okay. This like this like what I believe okay. like in the school like how to change education. The government. Yeah. That's Thank you. Yeah, I got your point. Thank you very much. So I think your 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 central question is. Uh, uh, you are approaching uh, Saudi uh, wealthy and Arab wealthy donors yeah. to help build education yeah. infrastructure. Yeah, that's okay. the area. Like, yeah. Just, yeah. So I think, I think in general, investment in education is uh, one of the best that you could do. But many of these communities are very independent. And the Murids, for example, are very proud of being very independent. The, the Murid community, uh, they just build the biggest mosque and they're very proud to say on national TV that no money from the government, local government, or external government has contributed. So I think there are two levels here. The tradition that uh, uh, going to Saudi Arabia and Kuwait 
uh, to help build infrastructures exist. Yeah, actually, in many communities, they build wells. I have seen wells. Uh, I've seen a uh, mosque being built. But investment in school, I haven't seen. Okay, okay. So maybe that's uh, that's that's uh, that's a good uh, option for some people. Uh, but my central point is that even even if we were to ask for even if these. Uh, uh, schools and Quranic schools were to ask help, I suspect they would promote the, st uh, the study of Arabic, al-Fusha, uh, which I am not sure is the same. <laughs> uh, it's not the same. So what happens, and I think ISESCO, the funding that was from ISESCO, was trying to do that, was trying to harmonize the writing system of all the systems, uh, the Ajami systems, and then maybe using that to help education. But the problem is, again, it was a top-down approach. They did not ask people. They came with the designs. They said, okay, you're Wolof, you like the Arabic script, you're Muslim, so this is good for you. It shouldn't be like that. It should have been reversed. They should have asked, which of these letters do you prefer for your book? <laughs> and standardize it. I think that education would work. And I think if there's support for that kind of education, I think it would be, would be a good idea. But thanks for your, for your questions. Yes, um, so did you? My question is... What's your name? Rebecca. Rebecca. Yeah. My question is, how did you even find yourself? Okay, how I found? Okay. That's a long question, huh? <laughs> um, my name is Rebecca, and uh -huh. my question is, how did you even find yourself studying Ajami? Where did it start? Uh, is it something that you always knew you wanted to do? Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's a long, long question. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I, I stumbled on it, that's the truth. Yeah. I was uh, very ignorant of Ajami until 2004. My dad was an Ajami user. He was not uh, highly educated. He was a tailor, and he had kept his diaries and his records, his financial transaction in Ajami. But we were all told, and we grew up in the French system, where anyone who is not educated in the system, jungle. Huh? No, no, no. Huh? They're not educated. So I never thought he knew anything. <laughs> so, and I remember we used to have several. <laughs> so when he passed away, I collected some of his, uh, you know, some of his materials. I thought most of them were records of the family transactions. And so it was through one of those documents that I, I studied Arabic as a second language. Uh, uh, in school, and I went, I studied Arabic up to Mitriz, huh? So say hi to him, please. Huh? Uh, so when I opened this document, I read it, it didn't sound Arabic, it was Wolof. And it, it has, he had a debt, uh, he contracted a debt. And uh, kind of, this is interesting, he died in 1996, and I read this document in 2004, this pile of the documents I had. I thought it was kind of interesting. So I called and double-checked if the debt was true, and it came out to be true, so I paid for it. I said, you know, this is interesting, you know. Uh, so uh, I applied for a postdoc uh, to go see if this was only unique to him or it was larger. And I found that he was in the shopkeepers, everyone was writing in their own, <laughs> you know, the money because we're doing the same, but this is not unique to him, huh? This is the only writing system he had. He, uh, so that's kind of what got me into it. And the more I, I dig, the more I found, then I realized there is a whole world here I didn't know about. <laughs> because I was trained in a mode of thinking that made, me, uh, that made these things invisible to me. And that's kind of how I began. And then I began to look and I find that it's, it's not only the shopkeepers, it's also the farmers. It's not only that, but they're selling books in the markets. It's not only that, but the, I, I begin to, to see. Okay. Uh, and, uh, I, and that's why I think that uh, for me, uh, it's, it would be kind of interesting if my dad was alive, because uh, he wouldn't think I was going to be the one uh, looking in these things. Because we didn't get along very, very, very well. But that's just what turned out. Uh, yesterday, and I will end there, I found one, one document in which he had a diary. I realized I found that he had a diary. And in one of the diaries, he had my younger brother called Usman Gom, prediction of his birth. Uh, 
uh, actually yesterday I was during when I was coming around here uh, I was talking to my brother about the uh, okay so uh, just a minute here okay so this text <clears throat> okay, so he, he said man uh, ngom mangi bindfi lima yalla won ci ñaar fukki fan ak juroom ñaari ak juroom ñaar ci wëru tamxarit euh doomi xadi ñing goor lay doon na tuddu ousmane ngom and then he wrote the date in 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 uh, roman uh, numerals 2027 on 81 okay so this is the day he wrote it he, he said I've seen God has shown me my wife who is pregnant will have a child who will be a boy and let he be called Usman Gom. Huh? I called yesterday I said okay my boy est-ce que c'est vrai? <laughs> so it turns out that he was born uh, four, four year, uh, three years after this was uh, <laughs> So so this was probably this was probably in anticipation. <laughs> So I find these things, things like this interesting, you know? And see, it opens a whole world in my life, in my dad's life that I, you know, I think he would be, I just told my brother, I think your, my dad would be very happy. He thought we wouldn't care, so now we care, so. Yeah. It's interesting. It's for me, it's a continuing fun, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, Okay, thank you very much, everybody. And just if you're a graduate student or anybody, so the conversation can continue in AS, ASC, the seminar role in African studies. So for more conversation with Dr. Ngo. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.